Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're diving into some really interesting research on syringomyelia. SM. Yeah, SM in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Oh, wow. We've got a paper straight from the frontiers in Veterinary Science Journal. Okay. And it's all about how MRI screening and selective breeding could potentially reduce this neurological condition. That's fascinating. You know, SM is a disorder where fluid-filled cavities form within the spinal cord. Right, and that causes things. pain and a whole bunch of neurological problems. Yeah, it can really impact a dog's quality of life. For sure. What can you tell us about this particular study? Well, this study, I mean, it sounds um, like... He looked at a lot of dogs. Yeah, over 2,000. Over 2,125 Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Wow. Born between 1998 and 2021 in the Netherlands and Denmark. Okay, so a good range of years there. Yeah, and they analyzed MRI scans looking at the presence and size of these fluid-filled cavities. Which are sometimes called FFCs. Right, FFCs, exactly. Okay, so over 2,000 dogs. That's a pretty substantial sample size. Yeah, for sure. What did they find? How common is SM in these dogs? Well, that's where it gets interesting. The prevalence of SM actually decreased slightly. Oh, okay. From 38% in dogs born between 2010 and 2014. Okay. To 27% in dogs born between 2015 and 2019. So a decrease, but still a significant percentage of dogs being affected. Right. What's causing this condition in the first place? Well, genetics seem to play a big role. Okay. The study found that breeding two affected parents uh -huh. increased the odds of having affected offspring by more than three times compared to breeding with unaffected parents. Wow, that's a pretty compelling argument for responsible breeding practices. Absolutely. Did the study go into any more detail about the specific findings from the MRI analysis? Yeah, they did. One of the really interesting things they found yeah. was that even incredibly small cavities, okay, like some measuring just 0.5 millimeters could cause significant problems. 0.5 millimeters. Yeah. That's tiny. Tiny. It's incredible to think that something so small could have such a big impact. It really is. And it just highlights how serious the condition is, even in its early stages. Yeah. Which is why early detection is so important. You mentioned early detection. Yeah. Did this study look at how and when SM is typically diagnosed? They did. And one important point they emphasize is that SM is often a late onset disease. Okay. So that means... A dog could be affected, but not showing any symptoms when they're young. So a dog could have an MRI when they're young and appear fine, but then develop SM later on. Exactly. And it seems like it would make breeding decisions really challenging. It does. And that's why the researchers strongly recommend scanning dogs at three years of age or older. Okay. That would give a more accurate picture of their SM status. That makes a lot of sense. So based on all this research, what are the researchers suggesting breeders do? It can't be as simple as just saying, don't breed dogs with SM. You're right. It's not that simple. They actually propose that any Cavalier King Charles Spaniel ah. with a visible FFC, even one as small as 0.5 millimeters, be classified as affected regardless of age. So essentially, they're advocating for a, a more cautious approach to breeding. Right. Even yep. if a dog isn't showing outward symptoms. Hmm. But wouldn't that potentially shrink the breeding pool? significantly. That's the crux of the matter. You know, if you exclude all dogs with even the slightest sign of SM from breeding programs, yeah. you could end up significantly narrowing the breed's gene pool. And wouldn't that potentially lead to other genetic problems down the line? It seems like a bit of a tightrope. Absolutely. It's a complex issue with no easy answers. Right. And that's exactly why the researchers suggest exploring the use of sophisticated breeding software. Breeding software. What role could that play in managing a condition like SM? Think of it like a matchmaking service for dogs, okay. but with a focus on health. You know, right. these programs use algorithms to analyze genetic data from oh. potential breeding pairs. So it helps breeders exactly. assess the likelihood of offspring yeah. inheriting certain conditions. Right, including SM. So it's about using data yes. to make more informed breeding decisions. Exactly. Not just relying on what we see. Or even on an MRI. Right. Did the study look at any specific breeding scenarios? Yeah, they did. In their analysis. They looked at what happens when both parents were SM-free. Okay. When both parents were affected. Uh-huh. And when one parent had SM and the other didn't. Okay, so kind of all the combinations. Well, there's different combinations. I imagine breeding two SM-free dogs would be... The ideal. The ideal situation. Hmm. What did the study find? Well, as you might expect, the study found that the risk of having affected offspring was significantly lower okay. when both parents were free of SM. Makes sense. However, even in these cases, some puppies still developed the condition. Oh, wow. 
So even with the most favorable breeding scenario, right. there's no absolute guarantee exactly. that SM won't occur. It really highlights how complex this condition is. Absolutely. And that's why these tools like the breeding software could be so valuable. They can help breeders make more informed decisions even when dealing with these really complex genetic scenarios. What about the other scenarios? What happened when both parents were affected? Well, in those cases, the risk of having affected offspring was much higher. Okay. Which, you know, kind of reinforces that genetics plays a significant role in SM. Right. And emphasizes the need for those careful breeding practices. It makes you wonder, how common is it for two affected dogs to be bred together? Well, interestingly, the study found that only 15% of the parent combinations yeah. involved two affected dogs. Oh, wow. The majority of the pairings involved at least one SM-free parent. So it seems like a lot of breeders are already taking steps yeah. to minimize the risk Definitely. of passing on SM. But if even breeding two SM-free dogs isn't a foolproof solution, yeah. what else can be done? This goes back to what we discussed earlier about early detection. Right. The study really hammered home the point that the age right. at which a dog undergoes an MRI is crucial. Right, because SM can develop later in life. Exactly. So a dog might appear to be fine when they're young. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're in the clear. Exactly. And that's why the researchers strongly recommend that all Cavalier King Charles Spaniels undergo MRI screening at three years of age or older before being used for breeding. Okay. This would provide the most reliable assessment of a dog's SM status. It seems like they're pushing for like a more standardized approach. A more standardized approach to yeah, screening. To screening. It makes sense. Yeah. You want to have a clear picture of the dog's health. For sure. Before making breeding decisions. Absolutely. But even with these recommendations, is there any indication of how much we could actually reduce the prevalence of SM? That's the burning question. And unfortunately, there are no easy answers. Right. While the study suggests that MRI screening and selective breeding have led to a slight decrease in prevalence, okay. there's still much work to be done. So it sounds like this research is a call to action for anyone involved yeah. with breeding Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Definitely. It emphasizes that critical role that both early detection and responsible breeding practices play okay. in protecting the welfare of these dogs. And it highlights the need for continued research to further our understanding of this really complex condition. This deep dive has definitely shed some light on the challenges yes. and complexities of managing SM in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. It has. But what about for people who aren't breeders? What's the takeaway message for them? Well, I think it's a reminder that while we can't always prevent these kinds of conditions, right. We can be proactive in advocating for our pet's health. So things like making sure your Cavalier King Charles Spaniel gets regular vet checkups. Exactly. Assessing any concerns with your vet. Absolutely. And if your vet recommends it, considering an MRI. Yeah. Particularly as your dog gets older. For sure. Early detection can make a big difference in managing SM and ensuring your dog has the best possible quality of life. And if you're ever considering getting a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, don't be afraid to ask breeders about their breeding practices. Absolutely. And the steps they take to minimize the risk of SM. Those are all great questions to ask. That's a great point. Asking questions and being informed is always a good thing. For sure. Especially when it comes to the health of our furry companions. Absolutely. You know, this research also delved into some really fascinating details about the potential link between a dog's head shape and their risk of developing SM. A dog's head shape. Yeah. Now that's intriguing. It is. And the researchers even hinted at the possibility of using facial recognition technology wow. to assess risk early on. That's amazing. That's a whole other area of research that could have huge implications for how we understand and manage this condition. Wow. It seems like we've just scratched the surface of what there is to learn about syringomyelia. Yeah. There's so much more to explore. Yeah. It's amazing to think that something as simple as a dog's head shape. I know, right? Could be linked yeah. to. Yeah. A complex neurological condition like SM. It is. It really speaks to those intricate connections between, you know, genetics anatomy and development in these dogs. And the possibility of using facial recognition technology yes, yeah. for early risk assessment. Mm -hmm. That's a game changer. Huge game changer. Absolutely. It opens up a whole new avenue for early intervention and could really revolutionize how we approach breeding decisions. One thing that really struck me about this research. Yeah was its focus on the ethical considerations. Yeah, me too. 
That was a key takeaway for me as well. It's not just about, you know, reducing the prevalence of one condition. Right. But about making sure we're ensuring the overall health and well-being of the breed as a whole. It's about making responsible choices. Exactly. That benefit both individual dogs and the breed's future. Precisely. Yeah. It's a delicate balance, but one that's crucial to consider. This deep dive has given us so much to think about. It has. From the intricate workings of canine neurology yeah. to the responsibilities we have uh, as pet owners and breeders. For sure. It's a reminder that, you know, we're constantly learning and that our understanding of these conditions is always evolving. If there's one thing you hope our listeners yeah. will take away from this deep dive, mm. what would it be? I hope they'll come away with a deeper appreciation for the complexity of syringomyelia. Oh. And, you know, a, a renewed commitment to responsible breeding practices. Well said. Mm. And remember, folks, knowledge is just the beginning. Yeah. It's what we do with that knowledge that truly makes a difference. From Vet Neurojar, keep those minds inspired hearts, light and tails wagging.